Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Chatham House. Um, I'm Robert Niblett, Director of the Institute. I know many of you here, but not all of you. Um, delighted that you could join us today on this um, quiet news day in the UK um, uh, to talk, which we love doing in the UK, about things um, that are global and international. Um, and I've uh, got a great group with us today to tackle uh, the issue of the day, technology and diplomacy in the digital age. Um, and uh, it's a subject that is very dear to our heart. Um, Chatham House has been actively involved in technology-related issues through all of its areas of research for a number of years. Um, but we've tried to sort of uh, capture the fact that technology is so interwoven with all aspects of policy through the Digital Society Initiative that we set up uh, about a year and a half ago, formally run by Marjorie Bussa, my colleague who's at the front. Um, and we've done a whole series of technology-related events um, across the whole spectrum of, of, uh, of dimensions of policy that it affects. Um, but I'm not sure we've done one specifically on technology and diplomacy. Um, and we wanted to take this opportunity, not least because uh, I think I could say my friend Kasper Klinger is here, who um, uh, was kind enough to host me um, in Silicon Valley, I'll say, I don't know which, quite where we were in your uh, residence. Uh, it was a very nice neighborhood, that I do remember, um, which uh, the valley in Silicon Valley has plenty of. But uh, Kasper is one of the first uh, in the world, um, technology ambassadors, and therefore responsible for um, uh, that new area of uh, diplomacy that many people now call techplomacy. I think I'll, I'll uh, get that right. And uh, it's a fascinating evolution that the Danish government have undertaken, uh, where he is an ambassador based in Silicon Valley, but with staff uh, uh, reporting to him in Copenhagen and also reporting to him in Beijing, I believe, yes? I don't know if you've got any other offices as well. You'll say about that maybe in a minute. But I think it really captures the way in which some of the smaller states by uh, a population size are really seizing the opportunity of technology in their diplomacy and in the way it's changing diplomacy. And we thought um, we'd been looking for an opportunity to have him here at the Chatham House for one of our public members' events. Um, and having lured him here, um, we thought it'd be good to get a group together. And so I'm thrilled that Leanne Saunders, who's the Director of Strategy at the Foreign Office, um, uh, and somebody who's therefore intimately involved and knowledgeable of all of the dimensions of British uh, strategic approaches to its foreign policy, including uh, digital diplomacy um, and digital relations, has also been able to join us at this quiet period that you have at the moment uh, from this uh, dimension. Um, and what's good is Leanne has worked in a lot of the traditional areas of British diplomacy, uh, counterproliferation, managing crisis centers in the Middle East. You've been very much at the coalface of what it is to have to be a diplomat in the digital age. Uh, and therefore, we thought it would be fantastic to have her uh, join us um, as well for this, uh, for this panel. Um, ambassador Tina Intelman, who is the ambassador of Estonia here in London. Um, Estonia always gets rolled out for these types of events, as she will know extremely well, because um, under Thomas Ilvis, the former uh, president, Estonia has been one of the pioneers of integrating technology into domestic politics, into how do you run the country uh, entirely. And we thought it'd be particularly interesting, therefore, to have you here for this panel of how the international dimension, the diplomacy as well, connects and how Estonia is thinking um, about that dimension uh, as well. And then Ashish uh, Jaiman, who's a, a technology innovator now with Microsoft, where he leads a number of very interesting initiatives. The one that's definitely got him on this panel is a director of technology and operations for the Defending Democracy program. Uh, and the mere fact that a technology company as ubiquitous, large, successful uh, as Microsoft would have somebody in your role, as she tells us, a lot. Um, and we thought, obviously, having business uh, and those developing the technology um, very much at the table would be important, because otherwise, as the saying goes, you would be on the menu. So it's better to have you here um, as well, being able to, we really look forward to your viewpoints and how companies are trying to tackle this, this dimension. So this meeting is on the record. Um, we'll have a conversation. We'll open it up uh, for comments and questions from all of you here. Thank you for 
joining us uh, today. Um, and I suppose the simple thing, uh, Kasper, to start with you, and I did want to say just one extra element. We have an essay competition, actually we're doing, aren't we, of being technology ambassador for a day as part of our World Today essay competition this year for students. Um, uh, deadline through 20th of December, so any of our student members are here who haven't thought about applying for that, the information is all on our website and our World Today uh, uh, page. Um, but I suppose that gives me an entry question to you, which is, you know, what does it take to be a technology ambassador? Um, why did your government do this? What is it that you think you're bringing differently about uh, being based the way you are there, not as an ambassador to the country, but as somebody responsible for this whole area outside your country from there? Just tell us a little bit about that to start with. Yeah, well, thanks very much for, for organizing this to, to all of you. And can I disrupt it a little bit by asking uh, the do. audience uh, okay, uh, a question? Because I, th I think, could you raise your hands if you're more concerned about technology today than you were two years ago? Anyone who's got an arm, I think, has put it up, nearly. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, we had an event in, in Copenhagen a few weeks ago, actually, with the president of Microsoft at the IT University, where you're educating uh, software engineers and programmers. And, and I did the same sort of poll, and I think basically everybody raised their hands. And, and you're reminding people that these are uh, students that will probably, you know, want to join Microsoft or Google or, or Facebook in, in the next couple of years. And I think this shows that the debate about technology is different today than it was a couple of years ago. I would probably argue that it's more mature, less naive, um, and it's very much uh, one of the reasons why it is so is because of some of the scandals we've seen, Cambridge Analytica, leaks of personal data, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure if you go on the streets in London or in Copenhagen or even in, in Palo Alto and ask people, so what has the biggest impact on your life? Is it what happens on Instagram or on Snapchat, or is it what happens in country X or country Y? A lot of people, perhaps some of them a little bit younger than, than <laughs> we are, uh, would probably answer, well, it actually what happens on, on some of the social media platforms. So why did we do this uh, a couple of years ago? Well, we did it for that exact reason that, you know, if we look at where the impact on the Danish society or Europe or our citizens, where's that coming from today? It's also coming from technology. I would probably argue it's very much coming from technology. And the big technology companies are playing a significant role, not replacing nation states, but becoming very powerful, uh, not only from a financial point of view, but in fact also trying to influence policies, regulations. If you look at Microsoft, um, you know, actually pushing uh, countries to, uh, to look at a digital Geneva Convention. So basically fulfilling a role which is very similar to what, uh, what nation states did in the past. And then you can say, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I don't think that's the interesting question. I think the interesting question is how do we relate to that as a country? And, and we decided, well, the best way of, of trying to influence those companies or influence where technology is heading is also to create a diplomatic posting that focuses entirely on, on, on technology and the big technology companies. Now, we also work with governments, that goes without saying, yeah. but part of what we do is, is relating to the big, uh, big technology companies. And it's both trying to sort of gather information to inform our decision makers on what we do internationally, how do we regulate, how do we create tech policies, how do we influence, uh, let's say, content moderation in the big uh, technology companies, but it's also to push out use on behalf of the Danish government. So in that sense, I think my job is no different than most embassies or most ambassadors uh, all over the world. Um, the only thing I would say, and then I'll, I'll stop talking, yeah. how has it been? Yeah. Um, and um, I thought it was Chatham House rules, but apparently this is uh, public. But I, but I can still say it's, it's been a very sobering experience. Um, and I, I normally make a very uh, inappropriate joke uh, by <laughs> saying that I, I, I was um, I was working in Afghanistan in Hillman province together with the Brits a couple of years ago. And I think uh, doing business with the insurgents and with the Taliban was a pretty good preparation for dealing with some of the big technology <laughs> companies. This is a joke, just to Did make it crystal again. clear. Um, although they dress more or less the same, the, you know, the executives, and they don't like foreign intervention either. Let me put that out there as well. Um, no, it's been a sobering experience in, in the fact that I think we are standing at a crossroad where we have to demand from the big technology companies that they take societal responsibility. No technology is neutral, and these companies, because of the power they yield, will have to engage with government, civil society, media. I think, by the way, their employees are going to hold them to account mm -hmm. even more in the future. And I think that is why we need 
uh, you know, diplomacy, why we need more international col collaboration also in the digital age. But you said, uh, just one follow-up point here, you made a very interesting comment that uh, digital companies are more like nation states. We, you needed to be therefore in the place where these companies playing that role were emerged. Yeah. But even in these last two years, and certainly in the last year, and you yourself uh, mentioned about this digital Geneva Convention, surely where these companies have just are just evolving incredibly rapidly into any company. Yeah. By that I mean where they're now building their offices and building them up is in Washington or inside yeah. the Beltway. Because in the end, they are discovering surely that they can't change policy. They may be asking for policy, like many fossil fuel companies are asking for more clarity on a carbon tax. Yeah. But um, are they really that different as companies? Or is it just a moment, the speed at which they've emerged, the fact that regulation has not been able to keep up, but that if we were to be here in two years' time or three years' time, actually running digital regulation and digital diplomacy is going to have to be done in Washington or Brussels or New York or, or UN organizations or Beijing or wherever. Um, is, is this like an early outpost because government has not kept up, but that you expect those companies to sort of slip into a similar profile as other very large multinational companies? Or is there something yeah. fundamentally different about this business that means Denmark will still have an embassy, you know, uh, in, in Silicon Valley in two years' time, three years' time? Yeah. Well, first of all, we're not replacing traditional diplomacy. I think that's important to say. We're supplementing it by focusing on a specific area. Um, and I think what you're basically saying, Robin, is, of course, that at the end of the day, you know, policy reigns supreme. You know, it's still important what governments and think. And governments do it. Yeah. We're or trying to do it. Oh, I'm <laughs> sure we're going to talk a little bit about yeah. the pace of technology yeah. development exactly. and whether it would be possible for us to keep up yeah. with that pace as governments or international organizations. But, but you know, the question you ask, are the multinational companies, Microsoft, Google, Alibaba, Tencent, are they different than you know, the Exxon Mobiles or the Shells of, yeah. of uh, the last couple of decades? And I think they are in, in one way. Because if you look at a company like Google, you know, what is Google? Is that an ads company? Is it a search engine? Do they do data-driven healthcare, autonomous vehicles? And the answer is, of course, all of the above. And that is where I think these companies are different. They transcend everything. Right. The cross-fertilization between the different business areas is enormous. And, and of course, the impact on our societies is, for that reason, right. different than I think uh, some of the old uh, companies uh, right. were. And that is why I think we need to treat them not as nation states, but as, as an entity with an impact on global affairs, on geopolitical affairs. And we, we have to, again, hold them to account, uh, have a dialogue with them, yeah. uh, a loving dialogue, but also sometimes a critical dialogue. Very, that's very helpful. And I think that helps capture that moment. As you said, it's not just the timing of the last two years, but this whole of society, whole of economy, whole of life uh, impact that they're having. Um, Leanne, let me turn to you. Um, British government, uh, I think, has been quite forward-leaning in the digital space. Uh, remember, we, the, the, there was a um, cyber security conference that was held here, gosh, seven, six, seven years ago. Had Chinese, had Indians, uh, all sort of countries from all over the world there. Um, where does, you know, is, is digital for the UK government more about how you're going to be doing diplomacy, or is it as much the subject itself in this kind of whole of society way that we heard? Uh, Casper described just now. So, so I think it's not just digital. So, in a way, digital is the old world. <laughs> you know, um, we're already through digital, and and technology and emerging technology has to be the kind of new world. And it's for all of the reasons that Casper has said. The connectivity uh, that you have, uh, you know, whether it's through companies or through states' use of. Uh, and, and, and sort of different sectors' use of technology yep. means that it is an, a sort of all-pervading aspect of our lives. And just like every other all-pervading aspect of uh, our life at the systems level, that's the sort of thing that diplomats, particularly when they're engaging uh, in, you know, kind of who sets the rules, what those rules are, and how that enables citizens to go about their lives feeling safe and secure in what they're doing. Um, and... Uh, to be able to develop the sort of prosperity and the sustainable development of the world, yep. you know, all of those will be tech-enabled in some way. Now, mm -hmm. they may be tech-enabled in good ways, bad ways. As Casper said, it, in a way, you have to be sort of agnostic when you approach this. I, I think from the British perspective, um, I, I mean, one of the things that, you know, we sort of have become aware of is that in one of my old domains of counter-proliferation, it was very easy to distinguish between what was a dual use, so something that could be used for sort of military uh, or um, uh, sort of military power type 
uh, aspects, security-related uh, ways by both legitimate and non-legitimate actors, um, and, and something that was you know, able to be kind of anodyne and, and therefore we didn't need to worry about. The point about many of the emerging technologies uh, is that uh, that they are all multi-use. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think, you know, being aware of that mm -hmm. is really where we come in to the, uh, to the picture. Because I think, as Casper said, you know, too often we sort of treat these domains as separate. We treat it as a commercial domain and we treat, you know, what we're doing in government as the government domain. But actually, we need to be able to have a conversation across those domains. Now, we can't start that conversation at the point where we realize that something needs to be regulated. We need to start that conversation right back as companies are developing technologies, as, uh, as they're innovating. Not to stop or suppress that innovation, but really to shape it and make sure that when it's being developed, um, the companies are really thinking about, uh, in that societal way, the potential aspects and the potential applications mm -hmm. that that technology may have. And I, I think that's uh, important for a range of reasons. Um, I was at a conference recently, and a technology uh, specialist admitted that when they had set up the early social media platforms, um, they had been more focused on the criminal damage that might be done through uh, those platforms than anything to do with malign state actors and the way that a state might seek to manipulate or use disinformation or uh, develop deep fakes. Now, I suspect that if a government had been involved in that conversation right from the outset, we would have probably thought about that because actually from a national security level, that's sort of one of the things that we always have in our mind. And it's not saying government is better at doing this. Patently, we're not technologists, but it is about making sure that we're applying all of our skills to be able to have the right sort of conversation so that we're aware of the risks and we're thinking right from the outset of a technology about how to manage the risks. Mm -hmm. Obviously, from the UK perspective as well, um, you know, because tech is enabling, the way that we manage our diplomatic service is changing. This isn't just about you know, every ambassador overseas having a Twitter account. Um, this is about you know, how do we actually make uh, our operation, our global operation, sustainable? Mm -hmm. How do we use technology to support that? How do we use it to reach our citizens? We're using a lot more machine learning uh, enabled uh, technology to support uh, our, our consular services, for instance. So there are lots of ways that we can uh, actually work more effectively and more positively as a diplomatic service, as well as thinking about uh, the diplomacy of, of tech in the world. Could you just say one thing? You know, the UK is renowned for being in the middle of lots of clubs, of the international mm. clubs. Um, maybe one less club, we'll see. But <laughs> You know, UN, WTO, G20, uh, the government group of experts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do you think this is a space where the UK government sees uh, that that kind of rule writing opportunity? Is that would it be fair to say that the, the British government has identified technology, or I'm um, use that word rather than digital, as a space in which it wants to play a role as a rule writer, or is it um, thinking about it more as UK PLC? what the UK needs to do for its own interests, for its own um, uh, you know, development of its companies, development of the technologies. Is this going to be a, a focal area for the UK, in your opinion, has it been already, for rule writing? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's an important area, uh, and it's certainly an area that we have applied ourselves to, um, partly because uh, it's one of the areas where, uh, because the technology is changing so fast, uh, there aren't always rules uh, mm -hmm. and there aren't always standards and I think mm -hmm. that's uh, also one of the things to think about is it's not just the sort of the rules you set for how technology will be used it's actually the standards you set when you are designing the ethics for example mm -hmm. uh, behind uh, AI systems and that sort of thing um, and it's really important that that's a broad conversation so um, I would hope that the UK as a, a diplomatic service that prides itself on its ability not just to be a rule writer in its own respect, but to broker mm -hmm. a, a broad community and a broad consensus around the sort of rules and the sort of standards that need to be written. Uh, and uh, you know, on the eve of our election, I don't think I'm saying anything <laughs> kind of controversial in terms of uh, that being a broad area, yeah. um, uh, you know, kind of across uh, any potential government that we might have. I think this, the technology one of the 
the toughest areas to broker consensus mm -hmm. around the coming years, but mm -hmm. we'll come to that maybe in a minute, and certainly in the questions, I would imagine. Um, Tina, if I can come to you, as I said, uh, Estonia being at the, at the cutting edge of rolling out uh, digital connectivity um, and services at the heart of its government operations. When you look at the diplomatic angle, you know, what do you see? I mean, Estonia has also been uh, the target for some pretty active uh, government disruptive activities trying to turn its strength into a vulnerability. Um, but is that the main focus uh, of the Estonian government, how to protect itself, how to protect its system? Or are you also forward-leaning country um, in trying to take your experience in writing rules or, or providing best practice for others? Where, where, where does this subject hit you? Uh, usually when I'm invited to speak, then I have to speak about e-governance in Estonia. Right. And then, of course, you know, very proudly say that 99% of public services are online, that there are only three things that you cannot do in Estonia, online, sell real estate, get married, and get divorced. <laughs> and also, I always say that, that you, we conduct elections online, and feel free to ask me why we're not afraid to do that. Mm. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, most of the activities that we have undertaken over the past 20 years have been to make our state consumer friendly, but also to reinforce our state. Right. You may remember that for a big part of 20th century, we existed de jure, but de facto not so much. So the result of that is that we opened a data embassy, which means that the whole Estonian state is backed up in Luxembourg <laughs> and, uh, and is, is being constantly, so to say, uh, kept, kept up to date. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't me mean that we are preparing for, uh, for the Estonian state to disappear, but it's always good to have a backup. <laughs> and, um, and the second thing also that comes to the, to the point of reinforcing our own state is that we have launched a program of e-residency. And at first we thought that it would be fantastic. We offer our digital platforms to citizens of the world mm. who want to conduct business on our platform, and we might make money. But when I look at the embassy, what is happening with our embassy right now, we have seen e-residents come in to collect their documents and to be fingerprinted, and we are identifying our new honorary consuls from amongst these people who are tech entrepreneurs and who will finally become our, amb our ambassadors, so mm. to say, right? Mm. Making us probably redundant. Yeah. I don't know. But it, it doesn't really stop there. Because while we were doing our, our e-governance activities, uh, we started seeing people coming in and asking, you know, can you also, can you explain us more in detail what you're doing? And as a result of that, we now, you have DFID, we have e-governance academy. Mm -hmm. And mostly our development cooperation is geared towards um, explaining to people how e-governance works. Why is it useful to save money and, um, what it is useful for, for instance, you know, cutting corruption, because mm -hmm. you, you, know, you, you increase uh, transparency. And, um, and um, it also helps with SD SDGs, and it also helps with, with all kinds of other things. So um, we now have an MOU with the African Union, we are working together with UNDP, and we are also working together with uh, separate countries you know, who are interested in in, in getting our uh, experience. But it really doesn't stop there, because you know, when we saw that using digital signature saves us 2% of GDP annually in Estonia, we started thinking that you know, making use of digital solutions should also become a norm elsewhere, so that we could have digital signature also across the board. For instance, with Finland, we have it already. And, and uh, as a result of all of that, our realization that you know, you're not strong when you're doing it alone, mm -hmm. we became much more forceful together with the UK in pushing these issues in the European Union, in the Council of Europe, and, and elsewhere. And uh, of course, you already mentioned the fact that we were uh, attacked. We, uh, uh, there was a massive cyber attack in 2007 which made it, it a very big necessity for us to start pushing also cybersecurity issues globally. We now have a NATO cybersecurity center in Estonia, but we also have to have 
this discussion even at the United Nations. Even if we don't agree, we have to have this discussion what kind of, of activities uh, in the cybersphere are, um, are permitted and what kind of activities are not permitted. So all of that, those are very important areas. And, um, and we, try to, we try to be on top of issues and, and we try to be uh, leaders in, in this sphere. And uh, a fascinating to hear the way, um, as a country, you've evolved uh, this process. Interesting about the academy as well, the idea of, of trying to export it. Can I just flip the question to you for one more point, which is uh, who provides the technology within Estonia? Because um, obviously the big discussion here in the UK and many other countries right now is who, you know, what is the nationality of companies or their residents or however you want to define their nationality in terms of providing it, given that you've got 99%, as you said, of social and economic activity taking place online, including uh, all the things you've described. Uh, what are, these, are these global companies, many, Estonian? How, how do you manage that element? Who provides this stuff? Um. You know, a very funny thing happened in 1991 when we restored our independence and then this idea of, of making a, a, a new sort of governance uh, a, a, in Estonia emerged because we realized that we were quite poor. We were not able to run our country like the UK is running. <laughs> so, um, so there were attempts to link with, uh, with, with the big uh, uh, US tech companies to see that they could help us. And actually this idea did not, uh, it, it was not very attractive. It was not too attractive for the big tech companies. So the government thought that, you know, why don't we allocate money and we try to, to promote our own entrepreneurial activities and, and, um, and it actually happened. So the, the bulk of these services have been developed by Estonian companies who from there now have become also global. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so you're doing, you're, you're saying you're doing that principally for uh, need. You weren't getting the input from the others, but I presume now, with hindsight, as you look at it, that would feel like the right decision. In sense of, or are you now inviting now that you've got a more successful economy and it's you know proved its resilience. Uh, do you now have companies like Microsoft or others knocking at the door saying we'd like to come and provide that service? And you say yes or no. No, we don't say no, because the economy is open. But, uh, but the fact is that Estonia may be one of very good examples where the government has had the lead mm. and the businesses have followed. Right. And now the governments have grown out of this uh, 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 waiting, uh, what the, uh, the, the businesses have grown out of what the government wants them to do, yes. and they have spread their wings. So in a way, yeah, it was a blessing. Which, I mean, we'll come back in a minute, but it sounds like almost the polar opposite of the world that Casper is sitting in in Silicon Valley. I mean, I, I can't think of a more opposite way of describing it than companies that have not emerged out of what government wanted it to do. They've emerged out of whatever the public need was. Um, but, uh, and now you're trying to reverse engineer the government around it. Very interesting. Um, uh, Ashish, perfect time, of course, to come over to you. Um, you may or may not want to play the mantle of all tech companies in your, in your comments, uh, or even entirely Microsoft, but I, I'm just struck that, they, that there is somebody at Microsoft with the title that you have uh, in your title as a defending, you know, director of the Defending Democracy program. I mean, it says a lot that the company has that. Can you just say a word or two about, I suppose, what you, let me say it, what's your job? Um, yeah. And, <laughs> but uh, which democracies are you defending? Yes. Um, how, you know, how, is it demand-led? Are you offering? Um, obviously, we can see companies want to get ahead of this particular debate as yeah. much as they can. Um, and Microsoft maybe has the benefit of not being in the acronym GAFA. Uh, to the best of my knowledge. So somehow Microsoft has managed to yeah. slip away from that front line, but yeah. go ahead. So everything is true, right? <laughs> As Casper said, you know, we, uh, we realized uh, that, hey, we, we, are, we are a big tech company which has some social responsibility as well, right? Our president, Brad Smith, is, is a pioneer in, in his thinking about saying, you know, we're, we're doing business, but business runs on trust, right? So how do you gain trust of the market, right? Uh, so there are many things, many uh, initiatives in Microsoft, and one of them uh, came out of the, the very fact that in 2016, uh, we saw something in the US, right? Which was like, yes, we, we have seen it in other countries, but in the US, it was first-hand experience by the country to see 
that there were uh, mechanisms to disrupt the, the basic principles of democracy. Uh, so our team was founded on that same principle with Brad saying, hey, now, being the world's biggest software company, we have a social responsibility and we should do something. Because in, it, it's true both ways, right? One is, yes, it is a do-good mission. It's a positive mission from Microsoft because we, uh, we are you know, very big, both from terms of revenue, but we have a lot of employees as well. Uh, uh, but also, uh, you know, democracy is good for business as well, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you think about that, you know, in, in democratic countries, the decision are not made by, you know, few individuals. It is, you know, in a long run, uh, innovation is fostered in democracies more than non-democratic countries. So, so if you think about both of those things, uh, our team was founded on, on very basic principle of we call ourselves defending democracy, but I, our idea was actually very simple, which was, hey, can we bring in cybersecurity capabilities to the key institutions, uh, both the, 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 the institutions that run elections, but also the institutions who want to get into the office, like political campaigns, political parties, and help them with the right kind of cybersecurity infrastructure, tools, knowledge, you know, uh, skill set, to make sure that their their process is not disrupted by nation states, yeah. right? And that that was that's how we were formed. Uh, so that was our principle. And then we said, when we looked back, we said, all right, you know, this is a big mission for a, a global mission for a ten people team. So what do we do? So we said, all right, you know, we'll we'll we'll, we'll distill it down to three things, right? We'll we'll provide campaigns and and political parties and and the likes with cybersecurity awareness, knowledge, skill set so that they can improve their security posture. Uh, we'll also work uh, with uh, electoral authorities, and every country has a different mechanism to run the process of voting, uh, with, with, again, cybersecurity principles with focus on election integrity. And then the third pillar of our, our, uh, our mission is what we call disinformation defense, right. because we think that that is also very important both from a perspective of you know providing capabilities to the institutions, but also awareness in 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 the democratic countries itself, or populations, or civic societies. So we work with think tanks and others. Uh, so that's how we we have structured our, our team. Just just one question yes. on that point because I've written so many questions mm -hmm. down based on what you just said. Maybe others will have them as well. Uh, you fight disinformation. Who decides what is disinformation, if you see what I'm saying, within the company? I mean, we're sitting in the middle of an election here, I'll simply say that, mm -hmm. and there's been some debate about what some of the parties yes, have put absolutely. out. Is it disinformation or is it aggressive campaigning? Mm. Um, yeah, so, so, we, so again, our, our, our role is not to define disinformation, but provide tools if right. someone wants to figure out if it is miscontextualizing some information or, or disinformation or maybe malinformation, then we can help provide both from an awareness perspective as well as tooling perspective to the key constituents or the stakeholders, right? Again, yeah. uh, we, in, in, in all of our mission of defending democracy, we are not here to put our thumb on the scale. We are not here to, to, to decide, you know, whatever democracies yeah. do. We're just providing them technical solutions if they want to use, yeah. especially around cybersecurity and now on disinformation around AI. One, one last question. I'm going to open it up because I'm conscious there's so much to say. We've only got 25 minutes or so to go, and we will all have plenty of chance to come back maybe on each other's points as well. Um, would another part of Microsoft or you work with non-democracies? So as a business, right, Microsoft has presence in, in across the globe, right? You know, I think you have the latest headline about a, China moving people a, out of, you know, a, exactly. a lot of countries, mm. right? Uh, our focus, again, is to, to make sure that we provide cybersecurity tooling as well as AI knowledge for democracies who want to leverage and also fight the, the external influences in their process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Clear answer, and it was on the record, so this is good. Right. Um, Questions, thoughts, comments, and as we've got a panel, I'm going to take two or three, you know, to go and uh, give them an opportunity to come back and, and have a bit of a conversation. The person here, yep. Yeah. Person back there, yeah. Start here. Microphone's coming to you. Um, 
Sure, just wanted to say thank you so much for your remarks. That was very insightful. Um, I worked in Silicon Valley in public policy for the last three years prior to becoming a student here in London. Um, and at the beginning of that very short part of my beginning of my career, um, I saw a big shift in how we were, tech companies that we were represented were treated. You touched on it, but I think The Atlantic was the first to call it the tech clash, um, and how tech companies went from being seen as the purveyors of like solutions for the future and um, prosperity to, to mistrust and something that we should look out for. Um, the public now kind of, the narrative is seen as we don't trust uh, tech companies for the reasons that were described. Um, they're purveyors of inequality. Um, and then from the government side, as we've seen in hearings in Washington, D.C., many of our legislators around the world just don't understand how these tech companies work. So how do those two elements of the tech clash, if you will, um, shape your work? Okay, let's hold the, the tech clash thought uh, at the back, and, and then I'll come here first right at the back. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. Thanks a lot. Sam Alvis, I work on counter extremism policy at the Institute for Global Change. Um, I had a question, if, you, if your resource was limited and you're a country like the UK, where do you put your efforts if you were seeking to write those, the rules for tech diplomacy in the future? Is it influencing the Saudis in the, for their G20 presidency? Is it von der Leyen at the EU? Where mm. is the biggest power broker when it comes to these rules? Very interesting question. Um, yeah, I'll be able to pass it back. And this gentleman there as well had a question. Um, Frank Gelly, member of Chatham House. Um, a question of disinformation, trolling, defense of democracy seem to be all interrelated. Only yesterday we had a shocking example of trolls trying to besmirch the case of, shocking case, of a boy who had been left lying on a hospital floor for hours and pretending, the trolls pretended it was all fake news, when in fact it was true. How can we do something to prevent that kind of shameful misinformation? Right, and we've got a first menu. I'm looking around, so I think I'll let, let's pass these questions around. I think, Casper, maybe start with you and, and give a chance to go around. Do not have to answer all of them, but the tech lash one, obviously, I think you almost described that as being part of the context that drew you into creating this embassy as well. Um, uh, that or, and or obviously the trolling resources where you put them. Yeah. Um, but I, I think you've been in Silicon Valley, you've, uh, you've lived the dream, uh, but I think you've also experienced that it's not only a dream, there's also a little bit of nightmare involved in, in that uh, situation today. Um, you know, if I look back two and a half years ago when I arrived together with my team in, in Palo Alto, I think there is a different discussion today with the big technology companies. So I'll give them credit for the fact that many of them are recognizing that, uh, that they have a responsibility. You know, also the word regulation or the word governance doesn't give a lot of people nausea anymore. I think that was the case two and a half years ago. And I think that's a good development. Now, my cynical, I'm a diplomat, so I have to be a little <laughs> cynical. My cynical assessment yeah. of this is that without external pressure, yeah. nothing will happen by default. So without you know, governments uh, teaming up, without civil society beginning to, to have an interest in this, without mm. academia yeah. beginning to focus, like you've done, Robin, here yeah. at Chatham House, on these issues and without employees beginning to hold their companies to account, I don't think we will naturally see uh, companies, even companies that are product of Western liberal values, take the necessary responsibility. And I think some of them are doing it deliberately, others are doing it because they've been surprised about the power and influence that their platforms have developed into. And, and you know, let me, let me go on record by saying that I'm, I don't think you know, you'll find evil people in, in, uh, among the C-suite in many of these companies. Um, there might be a few here and there, but uh, let's not go there. But I think many of them are struggling with very complex issues. So actually answering a little bit your question as well in the back, sir, what's the deduction of that? What, what's the consequence? What's the lesson learned for, for, for our diplomacy effort over the last couple of years? Well, two points. First of all, it's not about Denmark. It's not about you know, that we are a hyper-digitalized country. That doesn't really matter because I, because I think all countries are going to be impacted mm. in different ways. If you live in Europe, different set of challenges. If you live in Africa, very different set of, of, of challenges. Fragility will <coughs> pop up in, in different ways. And by the way, the digital divide on a global scale, I think, is something we need to pay a lot of attention to because that will be the root causes of migration, of extremism, of terrorism uh, long term. But the, but the deduction of that, what do we do about it? Well, I mean, Rob and I spoke about this in a podcast yeah. uh, some months ago. We need to begin looking at coalition building and alliance building in a mm. different way. It's not only about NATO 
uh, countries working together. It's also about saying we have to bring in the private sector. Mm -hmm. We might not always like what they're doing, but I think we will struggle with finding the right policies, mm -hmm. finding the right piece of, of, of regulation, unless we bring in the private sector and those conversations, both to hold them account, but also to learn and, um, and um, you know, have an educational experience. And I'll be very frank, I think one of the reasons why we are out there is also because the Danish government recognized that we don't fully understand uh, where technology is today. And I think the gap between our policies, mm. our regulations, our understanding and where the world is, unfortunately that gap is increasing uh, these years. So we need to come together. We need to work with, uh, with responsible actors that are willing um, to, um, to do what is good for humanity, not only in, in the sales lines, but also in, in reality. And um, just bringing you in, Leanne, I'm picking up on Casper's point here in answering this question. Um, there are a, a number of governments that would take a very different view about how one should regulate and manage the digital space and technology that feel it should be very much government-led. That the kind of multi-stakeholder approach of having business at the table and so on is not the way forward. That actually this is a space that needs to be regulated more in a top-down way uh, from from the outset and the get-go. How you know, a is that your interpretation as well? Um, and if it is, how can one play a collective role, or are we risking uh, a future in which we've got two different types of regulated digital spaces? One in which it's very multi-stakeholder, the companies involved at the front end, and the other is one in which it's much more top-down, and actually the standards diverge, the approaches diverge, even the markets diverge. And you know what I'm talking about here, obviously, with the yeah. China dimension as well. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I think I think it depends what technologies you're talking about, what stage of development they're at, uh, and the community that understands them uh, and, and how that operates. And, it, and in part, that's also an answer to, you know, kind of where do you put your diplomatic network? Um, actually, one of the reasons why the UK has a global diplomatic network and why we kind of try and reach as many places as we do, but also as many different regimes and, uh, and, and technical standards bodies as we do, uh, is because increasingly, you know, different types of, um, yeah. uh, of technology will have either an effect on uh, the development of, of rules in a particular space, um, or we need to think about the kind of ethics yeah. of a technology within that space. So, you know, two very different examples would be in telecoms, where, you know, we obviously do have to think about these things, and where there is already a very well-developed yeah. Uh, structure and system. So it's about how do you use that structure and system to talk fluently about the sort of technologies that are going to impact on that sector. Yeah. Another area would be something in the cultural space. Mm. So UNESCO has designed AI ethics. Mm. Well, it's obviously vital that that's being done. And as that kind of develops, that that's being done, you know, because that covers the sort of whole scientific and mm. cultural mm. Mm -hmm. uh, reach. Now, you know, neither of those bodies are necessarily sort of um, attention grabbing uh, on a world or a daily basis, but they are really important mm -hmm. because if you don't, if you don't build the right rules for the road and you don't have the right people in the room to have the conversation, and I think that's the point. Diplomats are always about having the right room, right people in the room to have the conversation, and there might be a series of conversations, and that means that it doesn't have to be a bifurcation of only government makes the rules or you know yeah, a multi-stakeholder. Yeah. You can have a combination of those things. The question is, have you had the right influences at the right point in the decision-making mm -hmm. process yeah. to inform the outcome that you have? Tina. I just think that we're uh, living at the moment of a, of a little bit of a shock that we realize that tech companies have done uh, something that is, has changed the world and that uh, we have not been thinking about regulating it. And now mm -hmm. the tendency is that, oh, let's just get together and regulate. Whereas we think that you know, if, if we approach the issue this way, that digital space is yet another place where humans operate. So a lot of the rules that we have for operating here or in a society elsewhere, you know, in physical space, should apply. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise we just go and, and over-regulate. Mm -hmm. Also the question of this, disinformation and trolling and defense of democracy, it's a very serious question. And, um, and in Estonia, we are getting that a lot, uh, probably because of the fact that, you know, in the 20th century, as I already told you. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, 
we have come to uh, the realization, actually, you cannot uh, control information. Mm -hmm. And that it's more and more that people have to use their own common sense and be aware of, of, of the dangers, because you, you just, how can you control? How can you tell people what is true and what is not true if there are so many different sources of information? Mm -hmm. That's a very, by the way, such an important point, one we're all grappling with here. Um, uh, Ashish, do you want to come in on this? And maybe if you want to, and somebody might say something about as well, the EU role in this, because that was a little bit one of the questions. The EU has set itself up in a way as the kind of, as a regulator. And it's ironic because it doesn't generally have the companies, but has therefore almost stepped into the role of trying to set some global standards, the most, most obvious being the, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulations, but there are likely to be others coming down the pike and there's AI uh, conventions on, on ethics and so on. So, yeah, do you want to pick up some of these points, yeah. but maybe address where a company in the US sees a group like the EU doing the regulation? Yeah, so, so uh, I'll, I'll come to that, but quickly, you know, going back to the, the regulation uh, thought, I think is, you know, uh, I agree with, with you saying, you know, m the regulation that we have in our, our, our normal human life, actually most of them can be very well translated into digital life as well. So, they, you know, whenever we see a problem, the first answer is, hey, let's actually have a regulation to curb it. I don't think... You know, disinformation uh, could be an example, like deep fakes, right? Impersonation of someone and falsifying information has, like, all kinds of regulations there, right? Mm -hmm. Financial regulations in a country like FTC in the U.S. would have all kinds of regulations uh, around, you know, impersonation, in, yeah. impersonating a business, yeah. doing false advertising and all that. So you can actually bring a lot of that right. into, into regulations on the digital life as well. Yeah. So that's one thing. The other thing I want to add to is, is uh, companies are realizing that, you know, they're moving very fast and regulators are actually trying to catch up. And there may be a day where, you know, say, all right, you know, let's just, just, just bring in regulations, right? And, and a lot of regulators sit in a room and, and all of a sudden we have to then start thinking about it. So most of the companies, what they are doing is they are getting in front of it, right? By creating some kind of internal principles, policies, and regulations as well. And I'll give you a very good example in Microsoft where we published uh, six principles of, of AI and ethics essentially, right? So, uh, and they're very, very, uh, simple to understand as well, right, which is fairness. So any tool that Microsoft creates, any AI system that is being created, uh, has to treat all the people fairly, right? So, so simple principles like fair, fairness, inclusiveness, reliability, transparency, privacy, and accountability of any tool that comes out of Microsoft. So essentially trying to get in front of that regulation train that may be coming, right? right? And, 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 and it's not just us, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, Google has, has created an AI ethics board. There are other companies who are doing the same thing. Right, right. Uh, so so my, my, my call here is that regulations may not be the answer, right? right? Mm -hmm. This is like a, a hard hand of regulation sometimes may challenge the, the innovation that is going on. And I'm not saying that, that regulation is not needed. I think the multi-stakeholderism of you know, everyone sitting at the table bringing the right people in and, and having common sense, simple regulations can suffice. Also aligning it with existing normal regulations we already have, bringing them in digital life may serve yeah. as well. Okay, um, question in front, question in the back, three. Um, yeah, I'll go here. Right here first at the front, in the back, and at the front again. Thank you. <coughs> Gil de Rapp, um, member of uh, Chatham House and uh, Centre for International Peacebuilding. Um, all of you have mentioned uh, implicitly or explicitly the national and international security implications of AI. And I believe that both Denmark and, and Estonia have, because they're small countries, have made this a, an all society uh, endeavor hmm. that actually everybody in the country is responsible for the ethical rules uh, that you mentioned, Ashiv, uh, and that you've put a lot of effort into education as a way of getting young people, and I'm aware I'm terribly old in this room, mm. to kind of appreciate how to think, how to mm. act ethically, and how to use these new tools wisely. 
Um, and I think you've been talking a lot about uh, how, uh, in, in your previous work, the strategic role of, of, of understanding the role of diplomacy also in, in uh, understanding how we use weapons for both for defense and for, uh, for uh, enabling uh, development, um, or, or technology rather. Um, and I think these all things are one part of the same scheme. And unless we connect the pieces, uh, in, in and having a, a, an ethical perspective on all these aspects. Mm. Regulation, in a sense, will be sitting on top yeah. of something that should be a top-down and bottom-up effort. Mm. Great. Um, right at the back. Hi. Thank you so much for the discussion. Um, Relika Russo, member of Chapman House. My question is, how do you tackle uncertainty uh, when regulators won't want to sit down with you? and? have this conversation um, to move forward. We're talking about, you know, potential world war is coming up soon enough um, if these things are not regulated. So how do you tackle this uncertainty in terms of what we can do now soon and fast in, rather than long term? So how do we, just for it totally clear on this end, how do we deal with the uncertainty in the short term around uh, technology regulations, is that what you're saying? Given the, the geopolitical competition that's going on at the main time, it's very hard to get fast. Okay, uh, right at the front. Thanks very much. Trisha de Borgrav, um, freelance writer. I, are we ever going to, in, t in terms of, you know, we, we information is gonna be what it is and we have to figure out the ways of, of deciding whether we agree with it or not. Um, it, are we anywhere nearer holding uh, a social media platform accountable for what is posted on that platform? Or is this gonna be just, you know, massive class action suits down the, down the pipeline? Mm. Okay, we've got some very specific questions there. I'm, I'm gonna run a little over, just warning you all here, I'm gonna run a bit over two o'clock if you guys are all right here, because normally when we have a panel, we, we try and do a, more like an hour and 10 minutes or so, because you can't get it all done in an hour. Um, so uh, we've got three questions there. Um, actually, when we start at the other end, yeah. not least is, um, you can talk about social media platforms without having to be one, so that helps you as well. <laughs> if well, you want to take that question. We, 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 LinkedIn. Oh, yes, we do have a, a social media platform, but you know, oh, no. it is a very self-regulated platform. The, the goodness of LinkedIn being professional network is, is typically self-regulated and people don't show up their biases on our platform so easily as they would on others. So, uh, but, but to your point, right, it's, uh, uh, there are some reg in, in, some, so in some jurisdictions, in some countries, there have been some regulations to, on, on social media platform and tech companies. Uh, but I'll tie back to one of the questions that I heard is, is it's, it's good to be in a democracy from that perspective that, you know, that tech companies would be involved in those discussions of regulation. Because in, in democratic environments, the, 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 the whole, democracy fosters that kind of discussion, right? So it's very hard, uh, and again, it goes back to my initial point is like, why is democracy good for business, be it social media platform, big tech, you know, or any other kind of business, is that there will be a voice that can be heard. Uh, so so, so uh, I think, uh, yes, there will be some instances where the regulations would come with a heavy hand, but I think mostly, tech companies and social media companies would have a hearing before a regulation comes down. That's my personal thought. They're gonna self-adapt is almost what you're saying uh, in that case. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, please do. Well, I just wanted to come back to the security implications of, of all that we're seeing right now. And there's a very fashionable word now, which is called resilience, resilience of societies. And that actually involves everything. That it involves people using their own brain uh, involves also looking at what is happening in cyberspace. Involves something that uh, we call cyber hygiene in Estonia, uh, increasingly, and also teaching that at schools, you know, what to do, what not to do. Uh, but also involves, for instance, uh, uh, something that we use in Estonia is a cyber league, uh, which means that people who are normally doing other jobs uh, in the run up to elections, they also voluntarily monitor at, at what is happening in, uh, in the space and what, what information is there. 
So resilience is a very, very important issue. Uh, and w where would you come down on the regulation of social media platforms and, and where, how is Estonia managing that challenge? Well, probably there has to be some regulation, but it's uh, clearly beyond, uh, beyond what Estonia can do. Yeah. So, uh, so your voice, again, I'm trying to think of your voice as a, as a kind of leader in this space. Are you advocating a particular approach? I, I think the, the overall approach is, as I already um, explained, that that we should, we should not over-regulate yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. And the temptation is there, be it domestically, be it internationally now, because it's like we have now, all of a sudden, we woke up and we discovered something, so we need the urgency of doing something. And, of course, a normal thing is, let's just regulate everything. Yeah. But it's not going to, um, to be the solution. And the one observation I make, of course, the place where social media platforms are heavily regulated or not to exist are in Iran, mm. which, you know, a few places that are not have the democracies we've been talking about. Um, Kasper, and then, yeah, and then I'll bring yeah, the end. First, first two questions also, I wanna address the, the security aspect of it. On regulation, we're seeing more and more CEOs or uh, company representatives advocating for more regulation. And uh, on the surface, we welcome that, I think it's fantastic. But I'll share a small state secret from the uh, frustrating life of a Danish tech ambassador <laughs> uh, doing business with these companies. And that is when you dig in or deep dive into what do they actually mean by regulation, then it becomes slightly more fluffy. Um, and then let me give you a very concrete example. I mean, the issues that we bring to the companies on behalf of Danish authorities are not small, tedious issues. It's about terrorism, it's about mm. child abuse, and um, you know, it's about yeah. illegal content. And, and the reply I normally get when I'm sitting in front yeah. of, uh, of somebody from the executive group is, you know, we remove 99% of all illegal content. Yeah. And I've learned the lesson now that we shouldn't congratulate that, we should say let's focus on the 1%. So mm. what is that in absolute numbers? Yeah. Where is it coming from? What do you do as a company to try and mitigate that? What do we need to do as, as governments to do the same? And then I can tell you that that conversation finishes uh, rather quickly because there is no specific desire for digging into those details. So yeah. my reply when you see op-eds in Washington Post advocating for more uh, regulation is fantastic. Are you willing to be transparent enough for governments or international organizations to do the regulation which is necessary. Because you cannot regulate if you're half blind. Mm -hmm. um, so I think with regulation or the need for the desire to do more regulation, we need to see more, see more transparency on, on, on the side of the technology companies. Now some are doing it, uh, others uh, less so. Now I just want to come back and perhaps address it from a slightly different point of view, not so much the educational aspect, but why is this you know, security policy in the most traditional sense well, one of the reasons is that you know, the big data-driven software companies are now becoming you know, operators in the sphere of the military-industrial complex. So it's not only about Lockheed Martin, it's not only about Northrop Grumman, it's also about you know, the software companies because not only with autonomous weapon systems, but in general, these weapon systems are going to increasingly be driven by machine learning, by algorithms, by artificial intelligence. So in my view, even if you look at it from a very old school security policy point of view, we do need to have a conversation with the companies as we would with any other producer of weapon systems today. And that, I think, is altering uh, you know, both the battlefield, but certainly also uh, how governments they need to look at it. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why I think last week here in London you had the, the, the leaders uh, meeting uh, in NATO. Yep. And um, you know, we actually put a non-paper forward in, in NATO based on, on our diplomacy initiative saying that the alliance will need to focus more on disruptive and emerging uh, mm -hmm. technologies. And I have to say, it, it was only one and a half sentence in the, uh, in the communique out of the summit, so we're a little bit disappointed, but it's there. Go and find it, it actually talks about <laughs> emerging technologies. And, and why did we do that? Because whether you are in the European Union, whether you're in the United Nations, whether you're working inside NATO, ASEAN, we need to focus on the consequences of mm -hmm. new technologies, both, both looking at opportunities, let me be very um, clear on that, but also trying to mitigate some of the risks that are uh, following with the, with the digital age. Yeah, and some of these points. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, in part just sort of following on from that, because I think, the, you know, we've talked a little bit about some of the sort of the big well-known technology companies, but I mean, actually the whole point about this is that emerging technologies are disruptive. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're by their very nature, and it won't always be the big familiar companies, mm -hmm. um, you know, in different domains, you know, synthetic biology, for instance, you know, that there will be new actors. They may well be small actors. Um, and so um, the, the question uh, that the lady asked at the, at the back about uncertainty, I mean, I don't think we will reach a time where we are 
uncertainty mm -hmm. because actually the, the nature of the, the technologies and the way that they potentially integrate with one another and have a sort of catalytic or a cumulative effect will mean that we have to be comfortable living with uncertainty. And, and that goes to Tina's point about resilience, because you need to be resilient against a range of scenarios. And at the heart of it, I think that really means educating citizens to be critical thinkers. Uh, uh, and you know that's something that within democracies uh, we value very much, uh, uh, but it needs to be yeah. sort of mm -hmm. taught in a mm -hmm. new sense. And we can enable critical thinking with uh, with technology. I mean, some of the examples that Ashish has given about tools that can support that critical thinking mm -hmm. are, are really important. Um, but but I think we we need to recognise that that we will be facing a range of technologies. We won't be able to regulate everything. Um, it, it needs any regulation needs to be proportionate because ultimately. Uh, we need citizens to be able to go about their lives, you know, living comfortably and not worrying at every second of the stage about, you know, what a technology is going to do in the negative, but actually being able to, to concentrate on the very many positives uh, that these technologies also have to offer. Just do one last round of questions. I've got a couple last ones and we'll be able to close up. Lots of hands going up as always happens at the end. I'm going to take the four I've seen. One, two, three, four. So please at the front first. We'll be quick on our answers in case people <coughs> had to get something else. Yeah. Hi, Libby Cash, student of LSE and student of Bastow at Chatham. Um, so my question is actually for Tina. Um, you know, in your opinion, is using common sense and citizens using your brains, as you as you put it, enough to actually decipher between disinformation and deep fakes and reality? Yeah. And you know, is this something can that that can actually be taught when this technology is becoming more and more advanced? That's a good question. I mean, you can use your intelligence, but if your intelligence is fooled by a deep fake, I mean, yeah, that makes it incredibly different. I think there was a question just behind you. Yeah, two seats, two rows behind. Uh, Mohammed Zahir, uh, public policy at King's. Uh, my question is, without a proper arbitrator between what is actually uh, misinformation, do, do you think the tools that you have in place are actually effective, especially when you think about governments using uh, misinformation on their own citizens as well? Uh, do you think that the tools can be uh, misused to actually clamp down on whistleblowers or opposition as well? Thank you. Great. Uh, there were two over here. Yeah, just at the back, and then there was yeah, young lady here. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, Matt Houlihan. I work at uh, Cisco on um, government affairs. Um, so this might be a naive question in what feels like an era of kind of declining multilateralism, but um, do we have the right international institutions to deal with all of the issues that we've been talking about today? Okay, that's a nice big one. Good. I'm glad we have that one on the agenda. And there's a young lady here at the front, uh, near the front, second row from the front. Hi there, um, I'm Jeevan, also a student at the LSE. Um, my question's on the multi-stakeholder stakeholder approach, which seems to be the preferred method. Um, by bringing tech businesses into the policy-making decision more and more, do states risk losing their sovereignty to the interests of these same tech firms? Mm. Yeah, multi stakeholder is such a soft term, but within it there will be power balances, um, as you just noted. Look, a lot of good questions here. Um, uh, I think I will go reverse, so I'll give Casper a chance to have the last word. Ashish, pick up any of these you want. I mean, deep fakes, I know, is something you work on specifically. Yes. I'm wondering whether you had a thought about whether common sense is going to be enough on this yeah so and resiliency you know yeah. yes so uh, i have some thoughts on, on defects and synthetic media and and one of my uh, one of my pet peeves with this this word defects is that it has a negative connotation right defects but the word itself means something malicious about it right versus synthetic media has so many good use cases Right, the, and like you know, art and expression. Right, you know, we have seen in, in Hollywood and given a a, a student uh, an, an arts major student an ability to create a Hollywood like movie to put a point out there in three minutes video is is powerful. Right, activism, the core principles of democracy can actually be synthetic media can be used there. Accessibility, which is so core to my heart. You know, giving voice to a, a voice impaired person, you know, synthetic voice, right? Or people who are visually impaired, 
the phone can talk to them about what's the, how does the surrounding look. It's all synthetic, right, at the end of the day. This is deep fake, deep learning technology used for good, mm -hmm. right? That's deep fake too. So, so I, you know, one thing, and that's where I want to go is, yes, uh, every technology can, is, is a beautiful tool but can be used as a, as a weapon as well, and that 5% that weaponization of a technology gets all the air cover. We're not talking about the 95% of the good use cases. So, but I want to go back to your point is, it's very hard to detect. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's like we are reaching at a point from purely technical perspective that it is becoming virtually impossible even for machines to detect. And, and that race is, is, is going on. In three months, it would become even harder to detect the deep fake. Right? So it goes back to the basic idea of, hey, could there be some right countermeasures, right? And that could very well be citizen awareness like, or uh, education literacy about what a deep fake means, as well as labeling of content, right? There is a regulation in China which actually comes like from first of, uh, I think, next year, January, where you have to put an attribution on, on a synthetic media, right? So, so anyway, so that's where I want to with my comments. There are so many good questions, so little time. So if each of you could kind of pick up one point in particular and we'll close up, that'd be great because I know we've all got to go on to another thing here at Chatham House with a lot of the young people in the audience as well. So, yeah. Mommy? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I fully agree that it may not be enough to use your brain or common sense, but if you look at it this way, propaganda has always been there. Lies mm. have always been there. Now that the lies have moved into the digital space, uh, it's clear we, we, we cannot take all content down. We can take down the content that pertains to child porto pornography, for instance. Mm -hmm. We can do a lot of things. But, but at each and every point, an individual in a democratic society also has to take some responsibility. It cannot be, like we are, I think that we are super used to being totally pampered mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And the world is a very, is a very dangerous uh, place to live in. What can you do? I was about to say, maybe a little... On this happy note. Uh, no, exactly. That's why you're going to have the happy note. <laughs> I'll make the one cynical comment, though, of course, you know, is, is a deep fake a political leader telling a lie? Yeah. Another type. They, they get called out on the lies they didn't say. Do you know what I'm saying? But never mind. That's a broad comment before Leanne comes So uh, I'll just make a, a brief comment that tries to take the multi-stakeholder and the, the uh, multilateral. Um, I mean, the answer is no, it's, it's, it's not uh, fully... Uh, kind of capable of dealing with uh, all of these things. Has the multilateral system ever been fully capable of dealing with the threats uh, it faces? And the answer to that is no as well. So we have to do the best job that we can. One of the ways that we can do that through multi multi-sectoral uh, approach and multi-stakeholder approach is to make sure that, uh, as Robin said, you've got the right balance of power in the room. And that means that it isn't just the big tech companies you need in the room. You need those smaller actors. You need those voices that aren't heard so much. And that often requires the convening power of governments to bring that together. But it certainly shouldn't be all within the hands of government or indeed within the hands of any one sector. Yeah. And that would be the point I was going to bring to you later, but including um, uh, less developed economies. Indeed. This is your point, I think, earlier. I think it's where the UK government wants to try and get in a bit. So very important point. Last word, Casper, to you. Um, do we have the institutions that are necessary for dealing with these issues? Uh, probably not. And I think one of the problems is you have a vertical discussion about these different technologies. So if we talk about cybersecurity, it happens in two different working groups at, uh, in New York right now. If you talk about mobile technology, a d different institution in, in Geneva. Um, can we create something that would encompass all of it? Probably not either. Mm -hmm. so, so as a small state, uh, what, is the, uh, what is the reaction to that? And that is to create a small multi-stakeholder approach where we basically try and create an alliance on responsible technology. Are we going to su succeed in that? Well, I don't know, but if we do, I think that could be hopefully a beacon for you know, pushing companies, and I'm not talking about Microsoft here, but other companies to take more responsibility, um, but also pushing governments to look at this issue as something that is so fundamental, uh, that is so transformational, that if we don't begin looking at it in a more systematic way, we might lose uh, all opportunities. So, Basically answering your question, will we lose a bit of our governance uh, power and oomph by doing this? Probably, mm -hmm. but by not doing it, I think we're going to lose it uh, altogether. So a very interesting panel. I took a few words away just because there was so much on here. Obviously, resiliency 
the fact that we've lived with this kind of problem in the past is just a different version uh, of a problem, maybe more scaled up. But if we're more aware, that's actually progress in itself, I would argue. And a lot of all the people on this panel have been helping with that uh, awareness. Educated citizens, transparency, but also in the way systems are designed, not simply once they're presented, um, which brings us to the multi-stakeholder approach. It's not just multi-stakeholder responses, but somehow companies having to let regulators and, com and, and governments and civil society into the process of creation. I mean, they're incredibly secret organizations in terms of the monetization side. So trying to break down that particular barrier. And the last point, applying rules we already have, as you said, on copyright, et cetera. It's, in the end, it's about enforcing rules. You don't always have to design new ones. There are a lot of rules out there if we can design them towards existing uh, systems. So with that, um, sorry, even though we could have gone on for a long time, but thank you very much for coming, and thanks for a great panel.